Hello and welcome to Panama Baptist Church Online. Really glad that you're able to be here with us today. By the way, my name is Andy and I'm part of the staff. I've got one announcement and it's for members. There's a members meeting December 6th at 7 p.m. We're going to celebrate stories of God at work in our midst that night. We'll elect officers. We'll approve the budget. Uh, that'll be really awesome. I'm looking forward to hanging out with those of you who are members on that night. Man, I've been so encouraged by people associated with this church. So many instances of people indulging their new heart, that, that heart <laughs> that longs to see Jesus and longs to see Jesus well done. I've heard so many stories lately. I, I heard about a mom who's reading a Christian book with her daughters, a, a, a woman who responded graciously to a difficult guest, a, a teen living with intentionality in a very specific situation and, and trying to bring their faith to bear on that situation. I heard about a woman uh, who's discovering what's the best way to be generous. She, she's got some resources and wants to use them well because her heart longs to be generous. Uh, a story about a man asking for help when he realized that he was being seriously tempted and, and without some help he was going to give in, but he didn't want to do that because his new heart wants to follow Jesus, uh, about a handful of people who gathered to check on each other and pray over each other's concerns. Oh man, that's awesome. These folks are lay heroes. They are saints. They are on the cutting edge of kingdom ministry. And this is one of the two reasons we make the effort to record these videos. We want to encourage you. We want to resource you. So whether you watch because you can't be here and you don't want to miss a week or whatever, or, or you watch because you're going back and because you, you want to remember something from previous, so you're using it as a resource, we are so excited by you. We love to partner with you, come alongside you. You, like I said, are lay heroes. You are on the cutting edge of kingdom ministry. You are saints. You are the ones that God is using often in mundane, often in difficult situations, to, to make Jesus alive to those around you. Not that he's not always alive, but you understand what I'm saying. Make it so Jesus is seen and his will is done. The second reason we record these videos is because sometimes people find themselves needing to look for a church. And it can be terribly intimidating to walk into a church and, and not really know anything about what to expect. It can also be discouraging uh, to, to try one church after another. And so we, we hope that these videos help. We can't duplicate, obviously, the vibe or the relationships here in the online world for you. But you can get a feel for the music and the preaching. And so, man, we hope this helps you if you find yourself in that situation. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we want this time to be centered on you. We come to you as your people. We come to you as, as folks who are in need. Come to you as folks who have many things going on in our world. But we, God, we want to give you our attention. We want to focus on you. We want to give you our worship. And we want to be changed and transformed by the time that we spend with you. And so, God, we pray humbly for that. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's the praise band. You can join along in singing with them. Uh, you, if you're doing this a live chat, you can hit that little heart button if the lyrics are resonating with you. Let's worship together. When I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast When the tempter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hold Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold me fast Oh, 
life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast Justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast Raised with him to endless life
Why do we see authors in the Bible consistently say things like, don't give up, keep running the race, keep fighting the good fight, keep setting your mind on things above, keep renewing your mind every single day, keep holding fast to the anchor that is the hope for the soul. So I think sometimes faith is hard. Or maybe you're new in the faith. Things aren't quite what you expected, and you're questioning whether this is all worth it. Or maybe you've been a follower of Christ for a long time. You have faith and trust. But then something happens that rocks you to your core. And in a quiet moment, when you're all alone, the burdens of life feeling heavy, there's this little thing that creeps into your mind. And it begins to weave through your mind, looking for a foothold somewhere where it can put its roots down. It causes you to hesitate. You, you don't want to talk about it because you aren't sure you're even supposed to be feeling it. And it's this little thing called doubt. Have you ever struggled with doubt? We're in week three of a four-part series looking at the life and ministry of John the Baptist. When we last saw John, it was in Matthew chapter 3. He, we looked at John, John's a simple sermon. That's what we called it. It had three words. Uh, it was a simple but confrontational message. Repent now, seriously. If you missed it last week, you can go back and find it on YouTube. Uh, John baptizes Jesus right after that sermon. And then John the Baptist disappears from the narrative. If, if we keep reading in the book of Matthew, Jesus goes into the wilderness after his baptism. And he's tempted by Satan. And after that temptation, uh, here's what Matthew says in chapter 4, verse 12. When he, referring to Jesus, heard that John had been arrested... He withdrew into Galilee. This is all Matthew says about this at this point in time. And then we don't hear about John for seven chapters. In those seven chapters, while John is absent from the story, we see Jesus doing a lot of different things. Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he performs many miracles. He heals a lot of people. He's casting out demons. He's calming storms. He's uh, talking to people about the cost of following him and what that's going to mean for their life. Uh, Jesus forgives sins. It's just one thing right after another. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus commissions the 12 disciples. He gives them their instructions. And then John the Baptist re-enters the scene in Matthew chapter 11 where we read this fascinating exchange that at first glance might leave you scratching your head and a little bit confused, but I think there are some real life applications for us in these verses. So let's pick up the story where John the Baptist re-enters the scene, Matthew chapter 11, verse one. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and to preach in their towns. Now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, we had seen in Matthew chapter 4 that John was put into prison, although at this point in time, Matthew hasn't told us why yet. He probably assumes his readers already know why, but Matthew's actually going to give us the reason in a few chapters why John was in prison. That's the story we're going to look at next week. But John abruptly re-enters the scene and he asks this basic question in verse 3, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? That phrase, the one who is to come, it's a very specific choice of words. It's a, it's a messianic title taken from the Psalms. In other words, are you the one we've been waiting for? Are you the Messiah? Or should we keep looking? I can remember once when I was working for Lifeway, on occasion you would have a corporate bigwig, a higher up on the organizational chart, come into your store. Uh, 
to kind of look things over and see how you're doing. And almost always when a corporate uh, bigwig would come into the store, you always knew about it ahead of time. Uh, you knew it. Fellow managers knew it was happening. Your boss knew it was happening. Their boss knew. I mean, everybody would know. It never took you by surprise. And that was the case on this one particular day. In fact, this was going to be my first interaction with this guy. His name was Donnie. Donnie was several steps up on the ladder than I was, and he was going to come into my store to see how I was doing. I was relatively new to the company, and uh, so we knew he was coming. I knew what he looked like. I'd seen him in some videos. I had seen him in some, uh, some pictures. We were going to know when Donnie was there, and Donnie walks into the store. They page me to the front. You know, someone is here to see you, so I come walking up. I see him standing there, and I'm nervous. You right? You can understand why. This was my first time meeting him. Uh, I, I start walking up to the front, and he comes towards me, and he says, Hi, Joel. I'm Donnie. That's all he says. And, and for the life of me, I will never know why. But in my nervousness and just... That's the only excuse I got, my nerves. I said, Donnie... You know, like, Donnie, like, Donnie, what's your last name? And so he told me his last name. Uh, and he must have thought I was crazy, as if there would be two different Donnies I was waiting for. You know, are you the Donnie that I've been waiting for, or is there another Donnie that's coming along? <laughs> uh, but he handled it gracefully, although he probably didn't think highly of me in that moment, and we were able uh, to move on. My question in the context of everything else that I knew about him didn't make any sense to him, I am sure. I don't know how you react when you hear John's question. Are you the one we're waiting for? Or is it somebody else? But on the surface, it doesn't make a lot of sense either, does it? Think back to what we just talked about last week with John. I mean, John had this really high view of who Jesus was. Do you remember Matthew chapter 3, verse 11? Uh, he said this, The one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Right? John is saying the Messiah is here. The kingdom of heaven has come. This is the one that we have been waiting for. Repent now, seriously, because he is here with his sorting shovel. Obviously, John has been keeping track of Jesus' ministry from prison. John's people have been keeping him informed, keeping him in the loop, apprised of all the different things that are happening. John is tracking what he's doing, and he goes from the Messiah is here to, are you the one, or is there somebody else? So what happened? Well, let's be honest here and call it for what it is. John seems to be doubting. Why? Well, I think there's probably a few reasons why John is doubting, why things are beginning to get into his mind and, and swirl around and making him wonder. And the truth of it is, these same reasons that are impacting John, I think, can impact you and me as well. So let me give you three reasons. And the headings for these reasons I've adapted from David Platt's uh, Christ-centered exposition commentary on the book of Matthew. Here's the three reasons. Reason number one, difficult situations. You know, think back to what was John's purpose. Why was he born? This goes back to the first week of our series. It was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he'd been doing exactly that. He was the one who was supposed to be out and about, right, preaching the good news. He was warning of the coming judgment. He was making the path straight for Jesus, the Savior of the world. Scripture says. But now as a result of all that, as a result of his bold and faithful, simple yet confrontational preaching, John now finds himself in prison. He goes from leading the welcome party for the Prince of Peace to a dark, cold prison cell where he experiences pain and hunger and physical torment and shame and emotional struggle as he sits there all alone. Oh, difficult situations can produce doubt. Have you ever found yourself doubting the goodness of God or doubting whether Christianity is even real or worth it? If the answer to that question is yes, or you know someone who has or is, or, or maybe you're there right now, more likely than not, that doubt was birthed out of a difficult situation. Why is this happening? Have you ever asked that question? 
maybe it was a shortened life or a really hard social situation. It was the loss of a relationship or a job that's so difficult it makes the daily grind almost unbearable. Maybe you received hurt and pain from what was supposed to be a trusted source. I think it could be happening here to John in prison, a difficult situation. But I think there's a second reason why doubt can begin to creep in. And that's unmet expectations. Now this often goes hand in hand, or accompanies the difficult situation. Right, unmet expectations. John knew what had been prophesied about Jesus. We read in Isaiah 61, verse 1, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. As we read through the book of Matthew, what was becoming clear was that Jesus wasn't meeting the expectations that a lot of the Jews had for the Messiah. Many of the Jews expected Jesus to just take over, to begin His reign right there, but He's not doing that. And when he wasn't doing it, they said, well, we'll do it for him. So in John chapter 6, verse 15, we read, Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You know, John the Baptist had, had prophesied about the judgment that Jesus would bring about. But there weren't any signs of that happening. Rome was still in charge. Sin is still rampant everywhere. There's political and religious corruption that are just ruling the day. And John was in prison because of it. And instead of overthrowing Rome, Jesus is spending his time with sinners, teaching them about forgiveness and performing miracles. The expectations that some had of Jesus simply weren't being met. Have you ever found yourself in a circumstance like that? Were your expectations of God that weren't being met? And along with asking, why is this happening? You're saying, it's not supposed to be like this. I thought this was going to turn out differently. I expected something else. And I think the third reason doubt can creep into our minds is limited perception. John didn't understand all that was happening around him. He didn't have a grasp of the bigger picture in the same way that you and I often don't see everything that God is doing. We can't see the bigger picture. John couldn't see what God was doing, and so he sent his disciples to question Jesus. Often when you and I have doubt, it comes from these same factors, and it's usually in the midst of difficult circumstances and unmet expectations and a limited perspective that faith is the hardest to come by. And sometimes the hardships that we find ourselves in are a result of sin that we've committed, but sometimes not. We can experience doubt even when, or maybe even especially when, we've been talking with God, we've been serving Him and living righteously, wholly devoted to Him, but then suddenly tragedy strikes. Things go unfulfilled. Confusion begins to occur. All of it gets in the way of our desire to serve God. We know that He is good, but we don't understand why the sailing isn't more smooth. And the struggle comes when we begin to let our circumstances inform our view of God. So what do we do with that? What do we do with doubt? Well, I want you to watch how Jesus responds to this question. Let me keep reading Matthew chapter 11. Now I'm in verse 4. And Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. And what's interesting here is not only what Jesus says in response, which we'll get to in a minute, but it's really interesting what Jesus doesn't say. Notice that Jesus doesn't dismiss John's question. He doesn't belittle him. He doesn't react with outrage, or disbelief, or scorn, or condemnation. How could you? There's none of that. 
In fact, in the following verses, if we read verse 7 and continued on, Jesus goes on to defend John to the rest of the people who are listening. And it's actually in those verses, right after John's question of, Are you the one? where Jesus declares John the greatest born of women that we've referenced in previous weeks. Now, Jesus receives John's question with grace and reassurance. If you have ever wrestled with doubt, know that you are not alone in this. Doubting can be a very real part of the story of your spiritual journey. Now, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. In the New Testament, when doubt is mentioned, it mainly always focuses on believers, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Alistair McGrath says in his book, When Doubt Becomes Unbelief, he, he says this, Unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. It is a deliberate decision to reject Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. But doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises within the context of faith. It is a wistful longing to be sure of the things in which we trust. If you've got questions like John did, ask them. God is not afraid of your questions. He can stand up to what you've got for him. Take your doubts to God. That's literally what John did. Are you the one, Jesus? Maybe you've got a spiritual mentor in your life, or you could reach out to myself or to Pastor Andy with your questions. You know, we do a Theology 101 uh, every month, and I enjoy that time together. I enjoy the fellowship we have in that group, and what I love about it the most are the questions. Now, we've got kind of a running joke in the class and that if you've got a question, please wait to ask it until there's like three minutes left of our time together because then that will give me several weeks to research the answer to the question. And I'm not saying that everybody that asks a question in the class is doubting. That's, that's not my point. But hopefully it's an environment where people feel free to ask questions. So I encourage you, if you are wrestling with doubt, ask so that's what Jesus doesn't say, right? He doesn't respond with indignation towards John. But what about what he does say? Now let me read it again. Verse 4, Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. Jesus gives two responses here, I think, two categories of responses. First, Jesus responds with a reminder. Jesus tells John's disciples to go and tell him, tell John what you've been seeing out here, what has been happening. And Jesus specifically refers to the blind receiving sight, the lame are now walking, the deaf are hearing, there's dead brought back to life, he's bringing good news to the poor. And I think what Jesus is doing here is he's reminding John of what was prophesied about the Messiah. And John would have known this, but Jesus is reminding him what was written in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, and a verse out of chapter 61. And as we read these verses from Isaiah, that was a prophecy of what the Messiah would be doing. Listen to how similar the language is. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy, for water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. In other words, he's saying, yes, John, I am the promised one. I am the Messiah. I am the one who is to come. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. And even though you aren't seeing right now what you thought you would see, your expectations aren't quite being met, it is coming. This is just the beginning. You need to trust in me. Friends, God will be true to his word. The Bible that we have access to is used to learn about and remind us of the nature and the character of God. And so use it as an anchor, as a stable foundation when things are crumbling around you. When you're questioning and you're beginning to have doubts come into your mind, get God's word out and pour yourself into it. That is God's letter to you to remind you 
who he is. And similar to what Jesus did here, where he said, remember all of these different things. Make a list. Remind yourself of all the ways you've seen God work in your life in the past. And I would encourage you to even make the list when you're not experiencing doubt, because then when that doubt comes, you've got a ready-made list. Pastor Andy has preached about that in the past, to have some ready-made thoughts. You could do that now. So when those questions begin to come in of the difficult situation or the unmet expectations or the limited perspective, you can get that list out and remind yourself who Jesus is. So Jesus responds with a reminder, and second, Jesus responds with an invitation. He says, blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. And that's just another way to say, blessed is the one who trusts in me. Even when it's not easy, life is full of difficult situations and unmet expectations, and you can't see the big picture. When the world laughs, and ridicules and scoffs and it seems contrary to all reason Jesus says blessed is the one who trusts in me blessed is the one who does what I say blessed is the one who follows after me blessed is the one who lives by my principles blessed is the one who repents and believes blessed is the one who keeps on keeping on and Jesus is encouraging John and you and me to remain faithful to him no matter what may come. Don't doubt in the dark what you know to be true in the light. Jesus responds to John's doubt with faithful love and mercy, as if we would expect him to respond in any other way. If you have doubts, so did John. Work through those doubts by reminding yourself who God is, what he has done, and what he calls you to do. Work through those doubts by staying on the straight and narrow, entrusting yourself fully, wholly devoted to God. He stands waiting for you. J.C. Ryle said this, Doubting does not prove that a man has no faith, but only that his faith is small. And even when our faith is small, the Lord is ready to help us. If you find yourself in the midst of doubt because of your circumstances or your expectations or your perspective, remember this. Don't allow your circumstances to inform your view of God, but instead allow God to inform your circumstances. If this has resonated with you, if in some way you're experiencing some doubt, whether big or small, Find somebody that you trust that you can talk to. Or feel free to reach out to us. Pastor Andy or I would be honored and privileged to walk through this with you. I'm praying for you that your faith will stay strong in the midst of life that is hard. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Before signing off, let me speak a prayer of blessing over you. May God give you a keen sense of His presence. May you satisfy the desires of your new heart. May you find and experience true community. May your faith be proven genuine when it's tested. May you take your hope as seriously as you take your pain. And may God bless you and the world through you. Amen. Hey, we'll see you next time. Until then, you are deployed.